Yeah, we can see. Okay, and you can hear me, I suppose. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about procedural generation in Wildermyth. Oh, there's a whole uh, whole bunch of stuff we do. Um, kind of kind of skip this slide. Um, Wildermyth, if you're not familiar with it, is um, character-driven, procedurally generated tactical RPG. Uh, it's in early access right now. It'll be coming out uh, 1.0 pretty soon. It's heavily uh, inspired by games like XCOM, where you have a squad of soldiers or heroes in our case, um, and Dungeons and Dragons. And we wanted to basically take the squad idea of XCOM, but really focus in more on the characters and their stories so that you could start with some fairly generic farmers or soldiers, but by the end of that campaign, um, you get to know them and love them. Um, and a lot of the design decisions that we made along the way uh, support this because the goal is that there's a large expressive space for players. Players will create characters and parties and relationships that they care about and are invested in, and then they'll want to share those and that will spread our game around. So that's that's kind of the philosophy behind a lot of our design decisions. Um, uh, pr why procedural generation? Mostly because I'm not a content guy. Uh, I don't spend my time writing. I spend my time coding. Um, and we started off as a side project. Uh, basically, me, uh, wanting to learn proper game programming, coming from a more of a casual games background and never having done 3D. Um, my wife being uh, the artist and uh, my brother being the writer. Um, none of us were level designers or 3D modelers or anything like that. So we, we just settled on procedural generation pretty fast as a way to make the game playable without having to build out a huge chunk of content. Um, so let's get into it. Um, we often say that the name generator is the heart of our game. Um, this is the name generator. <laughs> There's a little bit of code, of course, that goes with this, but it's super simple. It's just uh, key replacement, like iterative. I, I think you would call it a grammar. I'm not completely up on the, the lingo. Um, it's not fancy, though. We don't use any. Um, fancy uh, you know, AI techniques. But what we did is we spent a ton of time tuning it so that it doesn't generate names that break the fiction, hardly ever. Um, we basically want the worst name to be acceptable and the best name to be stellar. Um, so you see, we've got male names, female names, um, some place names and weapon names at the end here. Uh, and names are just really important to us as human beings. If you want to care about a character, the, the name has to work well enough. Um, we are also procedurally generating overland maps. This is important because if the map is the same every time, you will know where to go to do the thing, and that will not be fun. Um, so this was our first iteration. It's kind of an open space, we have this paper craft style. Um, uh, it, it worked well for us aesthetically, uh, but it didn't work gameplay wise. Um, it was difficult to know where to scout and how to set up defenses and what you should be doing, where you should be attacking. Um, so we ditched it and we went with a, a tile-based map instead. Um, the gameplay advantage being that that you're always on one tile or another. There's discrete tiles. You can you can build a defense that covers that whole tile. Monsters have to walk through tiles to get to your settlements. Heroes have to scout tiles, and and like there's no like weird. Oh, there's that one corner of unscouted area. The generation here is pretty straightforward. I um, I'm all about applied techniques. I it's this talk is not going to be a, a, a lot of academic interest, probably. I think we are doing some cool stuff with storytelling. But for this stuff, it's it's very simple. It's just grab a bunch of techniques from Google and combine them. Um, edge offsetting is uh, particularly, was a little bit tricky, but um, we got it done. Um, I can go into that later if that 
other if people have questions. Um, battle maps. I thought this was going to be a huge focus, and I really, actually, really enjoyed the Gloomhaven talk earlier um, on dungeon generation. Um, I was super excited about making a bunch of little algorithms to uh, generate different kinds of dungeons and battle maps. But in the end, we shipped um, basically five maps at the start, five algorithms at the start of early access. And they're all very, you know, pretty specific algorithms. This is a tower. It, it uses some Voronoi cells. It always makes a tower with a few chambers in it. Um, but nobody complained is the thing. Um, and that's what we, we, um, we realized was that actually the random terrain placement was doing a ton of the heavy lifting for us. Even though the map felt like you know, a similar place each time, we had made a lot of design decisions to make exactly where you stand important, to make the scenery important. So we have a, a combat mechanic called interfusion where mages, instead of being able to throw fireballs, they have to link up with a piece of scenery and then use that piece of scenery to attack. And then based on the kind of scenery it is, it can do different things, um, which means that the exact placement of the scenery is critical for your strategy and the scenery is all placed randomly. Um, so that that ended up being a really good decision. We have um, a couple of other like flanking and walling are, are similar, like they're designed to make where you stand very important. Um, and that that has worked really well for us in terms of being able to take a relatively small, inexpensive piece of content to produce, which is our maps, and have them carry a huge chunk of the gameplay. Um, but I think what people notice the most about the game is the, the procedural narrative. Um, I think we, we definitely learned a lot about it and it's become our, uh, our biggest production you know, um, issue too, is just generating this content, but let's talk about it. Um, we don't generate text, but... Um, what we do is we generate stories and character arcs and unique epic heroes. I would say the, the heroes, they more emerge. They're not generated this way, but um, they're generated very simply with you know, an appearance and a couple of history lines and um, some personality stats. But the choices that you make and depending on who gets injured in combat uh, and who you know, accepts a transformation or declines a different transformation, you end up with extremely different and iconic heroes by the end. So that's more, it's more emergent than procedural, but that's sort of the main goal of the game. And to support that, we tell these sort of finely crafted stories um, along the way, at basically at, at every fight and at the beginning and end of chapters. Uh, and that's a technique that I call the library of plays. So, um, I think there's a bit of context missing here. Um, in Wildermyth, you get these comic stories. There's, um, you get them at the start, uh, before every battle, at the end of some plot battles, at the end of most plot battles, um, when you scout a place. Uh, and these comic stories can be like, uh, they're in this format. They're um, anywhere between like a few rows and you know 20 or 30 rows for some of the longer um, comics and you click through and they have your characters there. They're assembled at runtime with your, your real characters. So you can see all their equipment and everything, um, all their transformations. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we generate those. So the metaphor that I use is the library of plays. Um, basically, if you imagine that you're in charge of a school drama program, you need to put on plays. You have these students, you have to cast them. And you have this, uh, this library of plays that you've, you've received from play publishers. You can kind of go through that library and say, well, uh, this play I could put on. I have all the people for this one. I've got, you know, I've got this one. This one doesn't work. This one requires some heroes that I don't have right now. Um, so you go through all the, that library of plays and say, okay, well, this, is, this has to be a, 
a winter special that we're putting on. So you start with the, that section of your library, you go through every single play in the winter special section, see which ones are possible. Um, cast your actors in those various roles based on who's, who's the best fit. And then those actors are gonna bring their own flavor to the actual presentation of the play. They're gonna bring their own appearances. They're gonna tweak the lines a little bit. They're gonna improvise a little bit. And that's part of the experience. And that is what we do. Um, so the first step is targeting. So our writers will, when they're telling a story, they'll say this story requires a poet, uh, a leader who's not family with the poet, and then you know a loner. And then optionally, we might wanna talk about a lover and a friend. So you can see that in the, in the targeting section over here um, in the UI. Um, those roles, they're just matched in order. We, the, it's, it's very simple. We just, the poet will be matched first. If it can't be matched, that event's not possible, we move on. After that, the leader will be matched, uh, the loner. Um, super simple stuff. We, there's a bunch of filters that you can set up in the targets to finally control who can be cast in each role, uh, but the process is really simple. Uh, and then we have these roles and we can use them in the text and also in um, the uh, outcomes and stuff if we need to have you know, game, game mechanical outcomes targeting specific roles. So uh, we use the system for combat also. You can see uh, for a weapon attack, I don't know, can you see my mouse at all? Anyway, um, I'm looking at the target section. You can see the self target, the weapon uh, has to be there. And then the target is an adjacent enemy. There's some details about you know, who can be. And then there's an outcome, which includes an attack role and all that stuff. Uh, events or comics are set up the same way. Um, self company site. Uh, company is sort of the, the company of heroes and has some metadata about what the player is up to. Site is the location. Party is which heroes are actually present at that location. And that's sort of the, who you need to cast in, in the story. Um, foes, who are you fighting? And then we have the story specific targets, hook, bookish, um, and then they're making a choice. So that's what's kind of going on here. Um, once you know what plays are possible, what events you could pick, you just you just pick one. We have some priority systems, but we don't use them very much. Um, it is nice to not repeat uh, events uh, between games. We want players to play again and to have a pretty different experience. So we do keep track of those events and adjust weights based on that. Um, but we don't we don't really do a whole lot of manually tuning it. Um, so that is where, once we have this event, we, um, we assign all of the heroes to the individual roles and the uh, dynamic text system kind of takes over, which we'll get into. So this is the comic editor. It's a tool that we built to do this stuff. Uh, it's two screenshots put together, so it looks a little weird, but um, on the left, you can see some example of what our markup looks like. Um, those roles that we used earlier in targeting can now be used directly in text. Oh, friend, what are you reading? That refers directly to the role that was matched in the targeting phase. Um, and we do a lot of splits. You can see in the second text box, friend.mf, that is a male slash female slash uh, gender neutral tag. Uh, we have a lot of tags like that that split based on personality, based on relationship status with another hero, um, based on class, based on really uh, age, uh, really anything we want to split on and tell a story about. So we do a lot of that. Um, and it's up to our writers to plan out a story and then go in and insert that variation for like, oh, you know what? If, if these two were family, they would say something a little different here. Or yeah, if that guy was a hothead, he would react a little differently. So we do a lot of that. Um, and here's how it kind of works. Here is um, the same event uh, played three different times with 
three different casts of heroes. And you can see each time it's personal, it's, it's matched to their personality and it feels like, yeah, it's the same situation, but um, feels very personal to them, hopefully. Um, but that doesn't make a plot. That is character development. Um, and that's cool. Uh, but but players want that sort of whole epic fantasy arc. So um, our I'm going to back up. Our first solution was to just not have it. Um, and it just wasn't satisfying. So our next solution, and I think the one that works the best for the game is villains, where uh, in the main menu, you just pick which story you're going to tell. There are four of them out right now. We're going to have at least one more for launch. Uh, and these are these are just authored plots, but they don't carry you through every single event. They're really just trying to hit the introduction and the conclusion of each chapter. So you'll have maybe 20 or so of these, you know, 20 to 30 of these villain events. And then everything else in between is the procedural storytelling. So you get your big plot arc from the villain and you get your character development mostly from the in-between moments. Um, villains are, there's just a script basically that um, you can define objectives that the player has to meet and then steps that we run through in order in order to like make the plot logic work. Um, so we are um, a lot of our players will play through all all of the authored villain content pretty fast, and they will move on to our procedural campaigns, which, like I said, right now don't have a lot of um, connective tissue. They don't really do any of that big plot arc stuff. So one thing that we are working on that we we want to release for 1.0 is um, generic generic chapter plots, generic plots, generic chapters, where each chapter we will pick from a pool a specific uh, omen, which is like what tells you what the, the problem is going to be, and chapter goal, uh, and a specific fight to go with it. And um, we will just stitch these together um, and and call that and call that a story. And I think it's not going to be as satisfying as the one big story that you get from a villain, but hopefully it should. Um, the main thing that it will do is introduce variety and um, we found that's the most effective thing. If you give players a huge space of procedural stuff, pretty quickly they start to notice the patterns and say, okay, this is all pretty much the same and I can stop playing now. But if you intersperse that with rare, uh, especially mysterious moments of um, authored content, they'll find that and they'll say, oh, that's different. And that makes me curious. And then they'll want to keep playing to find that stuff. Um, so I think that's something that generic campaigns are going to do really well, we hope, is basically by providing fun and interesting fights, um, they'll, they'll sort of keep the procedural content feeling fresh and give you something to look forward to in your next playthrough. Um, so yeah, so how it all works together. Uh, it's basically, it's alternating layers of authored content and system-driven content. And system-driven content, by that I mean a mix of procedural generation and sort of emergent uh, game system-driven uh, content. So we procedurally ch assemble chapters, but each chapter has an authored plot. Then we procedurally you know, pick events for all the in-between stuff, but the events are written. Um, the characters have their emergent personalities, but the lines that they say for those personalities are written. Um, just by alternating these layers, we get a ton of variation and it makes the heroes feel uh, much more real. Well, anyway, <laughs> 
it's working well enough for us, uh, but it does have some big limitations. Um, the biggest one from a writing perspective is we can't have crazy off the wall characters. We can't have a uh, weird party dynamics. We have to basically stick to uh, a D and D adventuring party. Uh, and there's reasons for that, um, which I'm kind of running out of time. So I'm going to go fast. Um, so yeah, we have our 11 personalities and we have relationships so we can write splits off of those. We can't do accents, we can't do speech modes, unique backgrounds, um, nonverbal, anything like that, um, because we would have to write it into all of our events and it wouldn't feel consistent. Um, there's a possibility that we could use some text generation for this very final layer. I've thought about building an accent system. So, you know, if you have a wolf character and you want him to like replace, every time there's an R in the word, you could replace it with like two R's to give him sort of a growly kind of voice or even just like change his text style uh, or do single word replacement here and there. You could probably get a lot of mileage out of that, uh, but it's out of scope for now. Uh, maybe Wildermuth too. Um, yeah, so so the big limitation of the storytelling system is it forces the story into this one archetype, which is heroic fantasy is what we've picked because it's familiar to everyone and it's sort of in the middle of the mainstream. Um, and we want it to be very accessible as possible to as many different players. Um, other stuff would be possible, you just have to write for it. Um, yeah, conclusions. Um, Hades does this super well. Just acknowledging what's going on in the gameplay always feels magical to the player. Um, mixing authored and procedural content is what you should be doing. Uh, if you have any authored content at all, just sprinkle it out and it will, it'll make the procedural content go so much farther. Um, I always advise combining techniques. Uh, I think, especially when I was starting off, there was a tendency to be a bit of a purist and want to just like generate everything from this one algorithm, but it doesn't work that well. Um, it's, you can see through it too easily, but if you just combine two or three or four techniques, um, you can't see the edges anymore uh, if you iterate on it enough anyway. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, uh, if there are any questions, here's my email address or whatever. Elan Ruskin has a, an amazing GDC talk that you should watch if you're interested in procedural storytelling. Uh, yeah, that's all I got, thanks. Thank you very much, Nate. Uh, that was that was lovely, and I'm uh, yeah. It's we have for the first time ever uh, everything procedural. We have a talk on uh, procedural storytelling, and we can see that it's a it's quite a different kind of uh, kind of challenge. Uh, I'm also super curious to you know as well how how will this pan out for you guys in the future? So once you have like your your cousins and your kids and your nephews and nieces and everyone is in the in the company, I mean you can there is really room to to grow in that direction. Yeah. I also, <laughs> I will ask the I will ask the first question. So I will I will use my uh, position of already having the the camera and the mic. Uh, you you showed some screenshots of that tool all, already in the in the beginning. Is this your game making tool? Is this is what is this what you're using to to create the all the content in the game? Because I saw one view was for the levels and another view was for for the dialogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the game is um, dumbly written in Java with libgdx. Um, I take responsibility for that decision. It should have been done in Unity. I would recommend using Unity, but we started it eight years ago, um, and I didn't know how to program graphics, which was what I was interested in learning. And Unity was mostly a 3D content asset management tool, which we have no 3D assets at all, no 3D models in the game. So um, the point being, yeah, we made all of our own tools. Um, and we didn't have a map editor for a long time. I think um, what, what Joris said about map editors was, really true, like if you make one, then you'll start using it. 
Um, and you don't want that. Um, but we eventually, we eventually did buckle and, and make one because we needed those authored maps to be easy to make. Uh, and then the comic the editors, a ton of work uh, went into to that and making it good. But as a result, another thing that Jorah said is like, um, these are some panels that we made pretty early on and they've been touched up. They're very simple. There's like a background, an actor, and one or two like other things going on. Some of the the stuff that you get later at Exodus is much more detailed and dense and like visually uh, interesting. So we found that like as we made our tool better, the quality went up, but the speed didn't so much. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's that's good to hear. It's in, it's also um, I guess that many uh, are facing the, the, the similar a similar kind of challenge. I actually wanted to compliment the the tool that you have because it looks so much like the game. I feel like it 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 <laughs> keeps you it keeps you in the mood of the of the game. So so yeah. with Unity with Unity maybe you can you can touch up your for the next game maybe you can touch up the color scheme of Unity. And, and and just touch it tiny bit so that it really feels because this is just this is just lovely, uh, <laughs> like a, like an editor that has a uh, a serif font. I think I, I think we need more. Of that, you know? okay, no oh, That's funny. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for for your, for your for your answer. I think that we have some time for for a couple of more of the the questions. I see a couple in the chat about localization. Um, so how do we deal with localization? It's pretty difficult. Um, we have localized the game into Chinese uh, through a partner. And the way that we did it is we basically built a, um, I think that doing it the tr traditional way, like in an in Excel or, or a localization tool, an external localization tool would not work for comics. You can do that for all the interface stuff, but when it comes to the comics, we built a separate view for translators where you can see the English text here and, and the translated text here. Uh, and so they have all of the full power of the tool, which will tell you if a tag is valid, which will tell you where you are in a split and what the split means. Um, and we basically worked with the translator closely um, to teach them how to write comics. Amazing. Thank you. I think that Arthur is next with a question. Yep. Hi. We can hear you. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, presentation. It's really super interesting to see that you can procedurally generate not only content, but also uh, stories. So that's just amazing. And um, I just have a question about how do you intend to um, somehow play test all these different stories you can uh, tell? Do you have a, a rough idea on how to like preview all the different possibilities of different stories? Or do you have something in mind for that? Yeah, what, what we do, um, if you're if you're working on a story and you want to test it in game, uh, there's uh, basically some cheats where when you arrive at a site to do a fight, instead of just seeing the event, if you have the cheat turned on, the list of all possible events will show up, and you can pick the one you want. Um, we could use this to make sure that you know events are showing up the right amount of time but we in practice we don't really do that we have some reporting on the back end that, that um, basically we take our logs and we bounce them off of a, a log aggregation server so we can see which events users are getting uh, and if some events are coming up way too often we can turn down the weight on those uh, but if you're talking about just checking all of the variety of the situations on the various things. Um, the one thing, the main tool that we have is actually in the editor itself. We just have a re-roll button and that will roll random characters for all of the roles in that comic. And that's a great way to just explore how the event acts when you fill it with different people. There's a lot of controls in there so you can set up different relationships and make sure that that all works, but it's mostly done by the writers uh, at, at authoring time, uh, if that's what you're asking about. Okay, so at the end of the day, you you have like a, a gigantic list of different knobs to 
leverage all the weights of all the different events related to each specific scenario game uh, I, I was about to we say gameplay tags but uh, like characters tags sorry can you say, ask again yeah sorry um do you end up with like uh, uh, a huge collection of knobs to leverage all the weights of all the different events yeah, we, we do, but we don't use them, basically. <laughs> uh, we rarely will notice that an event is showing up more than feels good for that event, and we'll just lower the weight on it or something. But for the most part, we just let it go because the targeting system already makes events show up at the right in the right situations, and events can only show up once per game. Hmm. So those just those two things on their own generally means that when you're seeing an event, it's an appropriate time for that event. Um, so we don't we don't tend to actually use the finer control very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. One thing is that that our targeting is fairly sophisticated. It can target for things other than heroes. It can target for like, oh, you have to be in the swamp. Uh, and it has to be chapter three or four, you know. So we can use if we have a story about heroes who are just encountering something for the first time we'll restrict that to chapter one and if we have a story about you know an old mentor uh handing off some knowledge to a new rookie well that can only happen if you have those two characters at the same time so it will naturally only happen in chapter three or four okay super nice <laughs> thanks Uh, hi, Nate. Um, you mentioned, I think, uh, a great talk, by the way. You mentioned Thank that you. the main state like tracking progress is like the villain storyline. And there's also some state tracking to make sure an event doesn't sort of get repeated twice. But that sounded like it was pretty much it. I was wondering how you write like compelling character store driven stories when uh, the characters can't have any history between each other. So we do track relationships. So characters can be friends, lovers, or rivals. Um, and, and I find that with once you have five people in the party, it's kind of difficult to remember who's friends or what. So that, that's why we don't have more types of relationships. Uh, we find that lover, lover is one that you really care about a lot, uh, and rival a little bit less so. But it can be funny if you do remember it. Um, so we track those and we use that, we use those a lot in our splits. We also track family relationships. Heroes can have children between chapters and those relationships can be used in targeting and splits. Um, but from a writing point of view, we approach it the same way that we you would like an episodic TV show where the episodes could be aired in any order. Um, this one character isn't so much like advancing their particular uh, plot arc, um, but they are bringing their personality to bear on the situation. We also do have some specific like side quests that heroes will bring up and go on, and those are intended to be more of those like uh, growth moments, but that's kind of a separate system um, from the main okay. content. Thank you, Nate. Thanks. Thank you for for that lovely talk, and um, and also it was a it was an informative Q and A. Uh, I would also like to thank all the all the other speakers now because we are kind of we have reached the, the end of our program. Uh, 